So let's finish up these tests with the scalar multiplication here. Should be straightforward. Vector 2D uh, vec. And let's change it up again a little bit. I'm going to do negative 7 and positive 3 there. And then I need to let's do vector 2D result gets 8 times uh, my vec. Let's call this result 1. And then vector 2D result 2 gets vec times 8. Like that. So we're doing a vector times a scalar. And then we should expect equal, or I could expect true, but I actually noticed something I thought. I had an oh duh moment. It looks like I'm comparing integers here when I do this, but I'm not comparing integers. Remember, our vector, if I click on this and hit F12, we're storing floats. And if you know anything about floats, if you watch the floating point play or the floating point videos in my C++ play list, we can't just compare equality because chances are 3.9999999 that's really equal to 3.9999998999 kind of thing. That, that's a really high level description to describe that floats that are equal in the computer, even though we're, we're using binary zeros and ones to store floating point values, um, floats that we would consider to be equal, chances are will not be equal because there's one little bit or two little bits or so many bits off in the float, even though the numbers are extremely close together, they're not perfectly equal. So there's a good chance that equality here is going to return false. We were getting lucky before because we are doing uh, straightforward integral numbers that the result, the floats can store perfectly, but we, we shouldn't rely on that. So there's actually expect, expect float equal, which compares the, it basically subtracts the two values and make sure that the absolute values, the absolute value of that result is less than some, it's called a mantissa, not a mantissa, it's called an epsilon or some threshold. So it'll subtract the two values, take the absolute result, as long as that's less than some threshold, we'll, we'll consider those floating point values to be equal. If that doesn't make sense, please go check out the floating point um, videos on my, my channel. Okay, so let's, let's fix this. Uh, expected is 4... Let me pass four here. I'm actually going to pause the video, not waste your time while I fix all these. Okay, so I fixed all of these ones here. I'm using Alt drag to do that kind of drag there, and then I fix these up here. And nice thing about testing is we know they worked before. I'm going to build this and run this. It should work again. We should get all green. So let's build this, run this, and good. We're all green. Good time to commit and then move on to the next test. So I think I'll do that. I'm going to pause the video while I do. So let's finish up doing our tests here. Uh, let's see. Expect float equal uh, result. Oops. Result one dot x should be equal to negative seven times eight, so negative fifty six. And then expect float equal result dot y. Result one dot y is going to be three times eight, so that's going to give me twenty four. And then Expect uh, float equal result one dot x should be equal to result two dot x and expect float equal result one dot y equal to result two dot y. <coughs> All right, now I'm going to build it, run it. Should it work? Hopefully, remember we're using test driven development in our vector two class. Pretty much does nothing except return empty zeroed out vectors in both versions of the operator. So should build, but uh, at runtime we're going to get these red. I'm feeling good, good reds. Since I'm working in isolation, good time to commit. <coughs> um, let's go back here, skip the commit part, but hopefully you get the idea. Yeah, we need to implement this. We need to get our tests to pass. All right? It's pretty straightforward. Hopefully it's. Makes sense that so we're going to do scalar times vector dot x, scalar dot times vector dot y, and copy because I'm a 
professional programmer and I know how to copy and paste without making errors, even though I did it this morning. <laughs> Uh, copy paste kind of bad. Um, scalar time. Now, if you think about it, to be pure, if I really wanted to be pure, I could do this. And since we're doing the right, the scalar on the right hand, right here, I could write my code with the scalar on the right hand, right there. All right, build it, run it. Hopefully, the tests go green. Looks like our tests are green. Good time to commit. I, if you notice, I, I'm saying commit a lot, but honestly, I'm. I am really picky about it's save games essentially. Commit, commit, commit. Uh, the more commits you have, the better, because then you can roll back incrementally. Instead of if you do like an hour's worth of code and all of a sudden something goes haywire and now you've just lost a whole hour of your life instead of just a few minutes, kind of thing. All right. Um, one thing though, I mean, I could I could leave this how it is. I'm returning the vector 2D and 2D, but li this is literally a copy and paste, and I know that. Uh, any value scalar times a vector, that's all that's defined to be and is always equal to a vector times a scalar. So I I could actually do some refactoring here by calling upon one of the operators from another and I'm I'm gonna take the liberty to do that. I'm gonna say let's return let's rewrite the scalar times vector. And now that I have the scalar on the left hand side, C will resolve that to call this this version of the operator. All right, but now that I've, I have my unit tests, I know they're good, I can make this change and my tests will test that for me automatically. So just build, run, make sure I get green. I get green, I'm feeling good. Good time to commit. I'm gonna pause the video and actually do a commit. Okay, so that's done. Also notice though, with our vector 2D, hopefully it's rubbed you a little wrong that I've written all this code in the header file. What I'm intending here is that everything be inlined and I should actually be explicit here and and type inline to have the compiler inline it. But if you're really pure, which I tend to be, even though it's a pain in C++, I, I don't like all these these definitions or basically these function bodies hanging out in my header files. The header files should tell me what a function or a class uh, can do, but not necessarily exactly how to do it. And right here I'm say saying what it can do and also exactly how to do that. So I'm going to do a little bit of bit more refactoring, which is a trick I've learned from a friend I'm going to right click here, add new item, header file, I'm going to call it vector2d.inl, short for inline. You can use any extension you want. INL makes sense to me, so I'm going to do inline, and then right here, I'm not going to do header guards, because watch, watch what I'm going to do here. I'm going to copy all this code, I'm going to paste it right in here, control A, control KF to format it to the the appropriate spot and then I'm going to delete all these function definitions here put semicolons out here so now I've made, turned these function definitions into declarations I've declared that they're also in line as well so the compiler is free to inline them and most likely will but then I have the definitions hanging out over here okay so I don't need to repeat the inlineage on the definitions because I put those on the declarations so now I can do do a little trick. I'm going to Control Shift S, save this vector 2D file. Go down here, pound include, include vector. Why is it not working? Vector 2D dot inl right there. Control Shift B, build started, build succeeded. So this pound include, if you remember from the preprocessor videos and in the C++ playlist, it literally the preprocessor grabs all this, control C, and pastes it right there. Okay, but it also keeps it nice and clean for us because now all I have here is is declarations and my definitions are sitting in the INL file. I still get the the benefit of inline, but I also get the separation from declaration from definition sort of concept. Okay, let me save that. I also noticed one other tune-up we could do here. Engine's going to be, there's lots of things that's going to go into this project over time, this engine project. Now if I put all the files here and, and, and don't put them in any subfolders, all of a sudden I'm going to have this big, fat, full, huge, flat file structure here. So I actually want to structure these a little bit better than I have. But I think I'll wait till the next video to do that. This video, we finish up the test. I'm going to control shift, run this. Control F5. Just make sure we still get the nice green here. We do. So I'm going to commit it, and then in the next video, 
I'm going to show you how to organize this a little bit better.